This is Dr. Sargisian and we will talk about disorders of white blood cells and lymphoid tissue uh, and we'll talk in general about alternations and hemostasis. So hemostasis is a multi-step process that uh, basically helps to transform blood into clot condition and again achieve hemostasis achieve uh, prevention of the loss of blood but before we talk about it we'll talk about different disorders of white blood cells as well as lymphoid tissues it's important to know where the cells are coming from so this is diagram showing that pluripotent stem cell can go two different ways and by two different ways I mean we can have a lymphoid stem cell achieved from here or myeloid stem cell. After lymphoid cell is uh, produced it may transform to natural killer progenitor cell, T cell progenitor and B cell progenitor. So natural killer progenitor uh, eventually will turn in natural killer real cell uh, T cells will be transformed through time as into a, a T cell I mean T cell progenitor B cell will mature into a plasma cell unlike lymphoid stem cells uh, myeloid stem cells give uh, uh, origin to many different uh, cell types and to majority of the cells you'll find in circulation. So at this point um, myeloid stem cell can break down to monocytes which will be turn uh, monocyte progenitors we can say which will turn into monoblast and then monocytes. Granulocytes this is an important concept, granulocytes can be transformed into three different types of cells which are also considered granulocytes. So they can be eosinophils, neutrophils, bas basophils. At the same time they can be considered still granulocytes because they have the granules and as we talked before granules can have substances inside them that may have some toxic uh, properties for the invading organism. Megakeratocyte it will be transforming into platelets and erythrocyte progenitor cell will transform to reticulocyte which is immature cell, immature red blood cells which will turn into erythrocyte. Erythrocyte of course we know already that it doesn't have a nucleus instead of it it has a indentation which makes it look like a donut with no hole and again the indentation signifies the place where nucleus used to be. white blood cells uh, can be named also leukocytes and again one of the important part or components of white blood cells are granulocytes again the name granulocytes comes from the notion that they have granules inside neutrophils, eosinophils and basophils so neutrophils are primary pathogen fighting cells neutrophils are the first responders to an invasion eosinophils they will help control allergic responses and fight parasites also they evolve into processes uh, such as asthma so please remember the expression again worms, wheezes and weird diseases so these are the eosinophils what they do. Basophils release heparin, histamine and other inflammatory mediators and basophils uh, we talked about it in the past that they can be transformed into 
mast cells when they migrate inside of the tissues. But again, these all three types of cells have uniting feature or common feature which is presence of granules and granules have some type of toxic or um, inflammatory mediator containing granules and uh, the granules make them different. When we stain those cells under microscope we will differentiate them from our granulocytes which do not have these inclusions, which do not have these granules. Lymphocytes, it's the different type of cell. So we have B cells that create antibodies and T cells that control the immune system. B cells create antibodies and they produce antibodies and T cells will be responsible for cell mediated immunity. So lymphocytes coming from the lymphoid stem cells and of course they can be found in the bone marrow. Lymphocytes constitute approximately 30 percent of white blood cell counts. It, sometimes it can be lower but uh, usually the number we like to see it's 30. Uh, again there are no granules so because of that we can call them a granulocyte so it's B cells, T cells and natural killer cells. So B lymphocytes they are antibody producing cells as I said and uh, they are involved in humoral mediated immunity. The second uh, type of cell as we said was T lymphocytes and uh, they will create cell mediated immunity. Natural killer cells uh, are lymphocytes who have different uh, receptors than let's say B cells and T cells and they naturally kill. So uh, natural killer cells are a somewhat different type cells from it from B and T cells. So how we distinguish all these three types of cells? The three types of cells or three types of lymphocytes are distinguished by their surface molecules and by molecules we mean markers and uh, which certainly can be identified by use of advanced uh, methods and uh, we can use uh, something like monoclonal antibodies and but to go back to the markers or molecules on the surface these are molecules are molecules are um, clusters of differentiations and they can be grouped into categories that are specifics for cells of different origin so let's say helper T cells they will have CD4 markers cluster of differentiation marker and uh, the effector T cell CD8 marker and these are like really simple examples that they always brought up but um, CD markers are widely used to identify the cells so again the cells really may look the same more or less but what makes them different it's the but what makes them different it the markers on the surface of the cells so uh, monocytes are the biggest cells in white blood cells. So they are approximately 6%. So 6% and when we say 6% about monocytes or other white, white or even red blood cells there is no set number of course. It's a median of um, percentage of 
uh, mo um, monocytes and uh, the number will fluctuate and between 3 and 8 percent this will be a uh, normal count but again it's easy to remember 6 percent uh, for monocytes so monocytes they are the largest and they have um, u-shape so and um, the monocytes they have long relatively long lifespan and it's uh, approximately one to three days of course compared to red cells it's nothing red cell lifespan but however compared to let's say lifespan of neutrophils it's uh, approximately four times uh, longer and uh, it helps them to uh, you know function longer and produce uh, better results let's say so the cells also can survive in the tissues for a uh, very long time for several months to years so when macrophage or when monocytes turns into the cell into the tissue i'm sorry it turns into macrophage again when monocyte migrates into the cell it uh, it's labeled as the macrophage so when it enters into the tissues so again um they have um, very distinct cell roles in they may be uh, cells that pre, pre play a role in inflammation as well as they have antigen presenting roles to cells so these are the cells that actually will digest the invader and but will present it at the same time to the T cells. So um, the role of monocytes, macrophages, is important because they are presenting cells, and um, there's somewhat a different type of cell from granulocytes and agronulocytes because of their long survival rate and their ability to present antigens to T cells. This is a picture that gives you um, some kind of notion to understand what uh, happening with the cells and how they look. You can see the granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophil distinct granules distinct granules think about granules as lysosomes and lysosomes that um, that have some kind of substance again toxic to the invaders a granulocytes lymphocytes has distinct nucleus but we don't see observable granules and uh, monocytes are having distinct u-shape and by distinct u-shape um, I mean uh, by distinct U-shape that they have U-shape themselves, their nucleus have a U-shape. But this is a um, depiction of different types of cells. On the background you can see those pale circles and they, there are the erythrocytes that do not uh, really define, that are not defined on this picture from the microscope so this is another depiction of uh, transformation of uh, myeloid stem cell already into end results platelets monocytes and granulocytes and erythrocytes so what happened here this cell actually comes from pluripotent stem cell and it will turn into committed precursor cell. By committed precursor cell we mean colony forming units. The colony forming units they would be precursor cells that will eventually turn into 
the type of cell that we need uh, in circulation. This process doesn't happen by itself for the transformation to occur, we need colony stimulating factors. Colony stimulator factors are um, chemical substances that are affecting bone marrow to produce certain type of cells. The most common and most known one is erythropoietin. It's a stimulating factor that will affect bone marrow to produce erythrocytes. It's also available in synthetic form as a pharmaceutical to encourage people with some type of bone marrow suppression or blood loss um, secondary to one or the other factor, that's say radiation chemotherapy. We can give this and uh, encourage the bone marrow to produce erythrocytes. But also there are other colony stimulating factors such as thrombopoietin which will result in, uh, which will encourage or facilitate platelet production. So on the other hand, what else can happen to pluripotent stem cells? It may turn into lymphoid stem cells. So from lymphoid stem cells, it will turn into committed precursor cells for T cell progenitor or B cell progenitor. And um, T cell progenitor and B cell progenitor will uh, turn into uh, mature cells. Well, T cell progenitor will uh, work through thymus and they eventually will turn into T cells and B cells will become uh, plasma cells. Okay? And also natural killer cells will occur from this process. So this is another depiction of the entire process and uh, this diagram will show you where the cells are coming from. This diagram is important to imagine or to have a understanding of what happens with uh, cell lines when one or the other uh, cell malignancy occurs. So again, this is the same slide. So. What happens if we're having white blood cells deficiencies? We can have leukopenia, deficiency of leukocytes in general. We can have neutropenia, and by neutropenia, usually the general umbrella term is agranulocytosis because uh, we really cannot differentiate, in, especially in old-fashioned lab technique when we were using the basically the microscope and the lab technician's eyes to differentiate between types of granulocytes. So the general term will be a granulocytosis, but it would mean most of the time that we are lacking neutrophils, also eosinophils and basophils. Uh, aplastic anemia, infectious mononucleosis are uh, other uh, sources for the white blood cell deficiencies to occur. So not only white blood cell disorders can affect the count of white blood cell, but something that may affect other instances such as infectious disease, viral disease, or even anemia. Let's look at the uh, lymph node and this is uh, basically a review of uh, anatomy and physiology and uh, by looking at this I want to give a very very fast overview of lymphatic system. We have lymphatic tissues which will include lymph nodes, lymphatic vessels, I'm sorry, thymus and spleen. These are all your lymphoid tissues. They would represent the place where your lymphocytes will proliferate, mature, and interact with uh, anything else, with other agents. So 
there are two types of lymphoid tissue, two classifications. It's um, central or better term is generative organs and peripheral. So by saying generative, it's the place when things or cells can be generated. And peripheral, peripheral uh, lymphoid organs are uh, the structures where mature uh, already lymphocytes can uh, fight the antigens. So these are lymph nodes, the spleens, and lymphoid tissues on mucous membranes and cutaneous immune systems, but the central lymphoid structures, there will be bone marrow and thymus gland. So where your T cells would mature and uh, actually in thymus gland, the defective T cells will be eliminated because they may react on themselves. So to recap this, generative or central ones are bone marrow and thymus gland and peripherals is spleen, lymph nodes, mucous uh, membrane associated lymphatic tissue, lymphatic vessels and uh, uh, cutaneous immune system. Leukemia is a malignant neoplasm of hematopoietic cells. After we talked about uh, differentiation of the cells to, into lymphoid stem cells and myeloid stem cells, it's time to talk about malignancies associated with those types of cells. So lymphos lymphocytic, I'm sorry, leukemia will involve immature lymphocytes and their progenitor in bone marrow. Myelocytic or myelogenous will involve pluripotent myeloid stem cells and it will involve basically all blood cells that come up from myeloid stem cells. So this is the uh, differentiation of lymphocytic and myelogenous. So lymphocytic of course at the end will affect B cells and T cells natural killer cells, myelogenous will affect isinophils, neutrophils, basophils, platelets, and uh, even erythrocytes. But these are two main types. Let's talk about myelocytic leukemias or myelogenous. Again, this is the diagram that represents the development of the leukemia, myelocytic leukemia. So what happens, we still have our multipotent stem cell which will give rise to common lymphoid stem cells and neoplastic myeloid stem cells on the other hand. Little exclamation point that represents the malignancy on this diagram. So lymphoid stem cells will be hopefully normal and uh, but on the other hand, the myeloid stem cells will give neoplastic precursor cells with all their uh, respective commitments and eventually this will result in abnormal monocytes or leukocytes. So again, the, if we go back to the beginning of the lecture to see the maturational stages, this helps you to understand how the myeloid stem cells become an abnormal granule, um, I'm sorry, abnormal monocyte or leukocyte. So, and uh, in the origin is multipotent stem cell, which will give r the origin of the, give uh, uh, rise or uh, to neoplastic myeloid stem cells and that will result in the development of an abnormal monocytes and granular leukocytes. So this is related to some type of mutation in this line, we, which we will have, like in any malignancy, we will have overproduction of abnormal cells. 
and uh, when we have overproduction of the cells we are spending resources as energy on this and other cell types that are not malignant will not keep up with this and production of their and their and I was saying on the previous slides that normal cell production will decrease because of overproduction of abnormal myeloid cells. So when the mutation occurs in lymphoid cell lines, it's a lymphocytic leukemia onset. Again, the committed precursor cells will be uh, at this time neoplastic because they came from the neoplastic lymphoid stem cells and uh, neoplastic committed precursor cell will give rise to neoplastic B or T cells or natural killer cells. So the same thing happened here. Abnormal cell production will increase while um, the normal cell production will decrease because again the same fact that abnormal malignant cells require lots of energy. Lymphomas are malignancies that arise from lymphoid tissue cells so either lymphocytes or histocytes and uh, there are two main types it's Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The, in Hodgkin's lymphoma, malignant B cells will invade lymphatic uh, tissues and uh, in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the B cells and T cells will be affected. So what happens in Hodgkin's lymphoma. In Hodgkin's lymphoma, one of the important features or the signs of the disease is that there will be Reed Steinberg cells present. Hodgkin's lymphoma usually will come from a single lymph node and uh, often it's a localized disease and uh, if we have localized disease we may treat it with radiation if multiple nodes involved we may treat it with chemotherapy and radiation so let's talk about uh, uh, in details about Hodgkin's lymphoma and uh, again what will happen the initial presentation of Hodgkin's lymphoma it may be presented with lymph node enlargement, a lump uh, which will be involving a single lymph node or maybe a group of lymph nodes and most common concern is the cervical uh, lymph nodes or mediastinal lymph nodes may be involved and uh, sometimes axillary inguinal nodes also can be involved but again the cervical lymph node involvement is very common. Um, Constitutional symptoms start occurring, patient will still feel um, sick, tired, night sweats, uh, fevers, chills, and weight loss. Again, weight loss with malignancies occurs because of the energy demands of, of most malignancies uh, that can impose on the body and that uh, results in weight loss. So Hodgkin's lymphoma has one unusual symptom and uh, this is very uh, specific and uh, somewhat sensitive symptom and there is really no explanation to it but if person with Hodgkin's lymphoma drinks alcohol and uh, the involved lymph node will be uh, painful. So treatment can be again radiation and chemotherapy and uh, if caught early it's very treatable and the results are very uh, good in this case. The age is this is young 
people a disease and uh, actually people will be uh, in the incidence of the disease will be increasing in 20s until 20s and that will they will decline until 50s after 50s the incidence of Hodgkin's lymphoma will be increasing and men of course more susceptible to that um, there is really no known cause of, or carcinogen for um, Hodgkin's lymphoma but again um, there is some evidence that HIV infection or actually acquired immunodeficiency syndrome may uh, increase the incidence of Hodgkin's lymphoma. To summarize, Hodgkin's lymphoma will be, uh, Reed Steinberg cells will be present and the patient will present with constitutional symptoms, may have only one node involved, ingestion of alcohol may cause pain in the node and the cure rate is relatively high if the disease caught early. So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are uh, neoplastic tumors again composed of lymphoid cells. Again the etiology unknown basically we don't know what happens but some may tie that Epstein-Barr virus presence can affect the incidence and also with HIV, the increase have seen with with HIV and also people with immunosuppressor therapy. Um, what happens here in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Malignant transformation can occur both in T or B cells, while in Hodgkin's it's only B cells. Uh, Again, uh, there is a potential to spread to various lymphoid tissue through the body and uh, disease may affect uh, many vital, organ, or vital organs such as liver, spleen and uh, travel through the lymphatic system. So, So what are the symptoms and manifestations of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? This again will depend on type of lymphoma and with uh, non-Hodgkin's the, there are variation of different type of lymphomas and different type of uh, different manifestations for the disease. But um, it may be slow progressing disease or it may be fast relatively fast progressing disease and clinical course and when we say clinical course or natural course of the disease is approximately five to ten years so basically what will patient may leave five to ten years without treatment even if lymphoma low grade and fairly uh, uh, Myeloma is a disease that presents with abnormal B cells and its myeloma is a B cell malignancy of terminally differentiated plasma cells. So what can happen in case of myeloma? Multiple myeloma is one of the most common types of uh, plasma cell disorders. So it's relatively rare and it's 1% uh, of uh, all cancers but among the disorders of blood or blood cancers it may increase up to 20%. So Again, cause for multiple myeloma is unknown, but there is some evidence showing that immune deficits, radiation, and pesticides and herbicides can 
increase this. So Agent Orange is one of the causes um, that somewhat determine that uh, have been causing myeloma and there are several viruses that are associated with it. Again, HIV can be increasing the risk or probability of developing myeloma. What happens in myeloma, the proliferation of malignant plasma cells happens. And what happens in this, that uh, the abnormal cells can form tumor. And uh, multiple myeloma will involve bones and bone marrow and uh, also involve the proliferation of marrow plasma cells which can re lead to bone uh, disorders such as bone resorption and if bone resorbs bone, bone will be destructed and fractures will occur at the same time as we know bone if it's resorbed calcium just don't disappear and go to bloodstream and because of that person will have hypercalcemia. So bone pain is one of the most common system that occurs in individuals with multiple myeloma. So because the bone is destructed that also will affect the production of other cells that really are not affected the cell lines such as erythrocytes and leukocytes because again it's abnormal B cells but um, because of this patient may develop anemia and neutropenia or a granulocytosis. Patient will experience also typical cancer symptoms such as weight loss how can this be diagnosed and this can be diagnosed by uh, blood test bone marrow aspiration and examination and uh, also uh, imaging studies MRIs so when the diagnosis is established at this point we can present with chemotherapy or even cell transplantation and that will be considered with the appropriate therapy for younger people and by younger people I mean the age below 70. So the relapse may happen with all people who had multiple myeloma and uh, however it's possible still to proceed with treatment that will be that will be uh, uh, suppressing the disease but again to summarize this we need to remember that this is a disease of blood cells plasma cells tumors can be formed one of the main manifestation is resorption of the bone through proliferation of osteoclasts and bone will break down and hypercalcemia with all the consequences of this would occur and patient may have complaints of bone pain, weight loss. This is Dr. Sargisian and today we'll talk about disorders of hemostasis and uh, as a part of our uh, weekly lecture. Before talking about disorders itself we need to define what hemostasis is. Hemostasis is a protective mechanism or the consequence of the protective mechanism of achieving uh, balance or protecting the loss of blood, protecting body from the loss of blood. So hemostasis is occurring by stopping somehow blood flow and normally blood uh, clots and the blood is usually we know it's a fluid and it's a viscous fluid we shouldn't forget that 
uh, however it will uh, flow freely under normal circumstances uh, when uh, it's inside the vessels but when the damage to vessels occurs it will seal the broken blood vessels by a clot so that's the normal mechanism very briefly and abnormally it, this may be results of inappropriate clothing or insufficient clothing so it's by abnormally i mean exaggerated uh, efforts to achieve hemostasis or insufficient efforts so when we have inappropriate clothing as we know from the past inappropriate from pathophysiology means excessive so we have hypercoagulative states and insufficient means we can't clot and we know that the name for it will be hypocoagulative states so if it's too much it's hypercoagulative or inappropriate clotting if it's too little it's insufficient or hypocoagulative stages of uh, hemostasis are uh, the following what happens uh, to achieve the hemostasis we will see that transient va vessel vasospasm occurs and this allows just very briefly to stop or slow down the blood flow outside and then formation of the platelet plug will follow and then it will be forming a uh, clot uh, clot and then formation of the clot will uh, uh, re be so platelets are one of the key play pl players in achieving hemostasis and uh, hemo platelets are thrombocytes like any other cells we know in the blood erythrocytes leukocytes and platelets are thrombocytes platelet formation is supported or encouraged or facilitated by thrombopoietin which is made in liver kidney muscle and uh, bone marrow so and by muscle of course smooth muscle <coughs> so when we have uh, not sufficient amount of platelets thrombopoietin is made and which signals bone marrow to produce megakerocytes and megakerocytes are precursors of the platelets megakerocytes are huge um, formations that eventually break down to uh, numerous platelets platelets aren't as long-lived as uh, red blood cells and platelets live only eight to nine days in circulations and um, when you're thinking about it what we are in the state of crisis and we need more platelets and production will take some time the good news is that mo there are lots of platelets stored in the spleen and when the, there is a need the platelets will be released mediators of hemostasis are chemicals produced by platelets what happens when injury occurs they initiate clotting by reacting with proteins that float in the blood and also another important function is that they help platelets to clump or stick together clumping is usually a good process beneficial process because it facilitate formation of the clot and uh, facilitate um, uh, hemostasis at the end on the other hand the mediators of hemostasis will also stimulate wound healing and um, also prevent clumping 
uh, I'm sorry, also facilitate the clamping of the platelets to vessel walls. Also, they result in vasoconstriction. They uh, support vasoconstrictions of these vessels. So there are numerous coagulation factors. Liver has an important role besides of helping with digestions and being part of GI system. It has important role of producing this plasma proteins and um, synthesizing them and uh, basically providing, supplying the blood with the coagulation factors. So this can be described as synthetic function of the liver. Again, it's a synthetic function of the liver to produce clothing factors or uh, otherwise plasma protein. There is a, one factor which is called von Wildebrand factor and it's made by endothelium and uh, von Wildebrand di disease is deficiency of that factor. So you can ask a question if we have so many coagulation factor why doesn't all clot why doesn't all clot uh, all blood I'm sorry clot and the answer is that the plasma proteins or coagulation factors are actually circulating as inactive procoagulation. So this is a description of coagulation cascade with uh, intrinsic and extrinsic flow. You see like how uh, certain factors like factor 12 turns into factor 12a which simulates factor uh, 11 which turns into 11a and uh, eventually this may result in uh, formation of fibrin from fibrinogen and uh, again these are the steps or you see it's like a cascade like waterfall or cascade is a waterfall with steps as you know so every step the factors drop down and uh, initiating the next. Cyclooxygenase enzymes are um, the pro product of uh, metabolism of arachidonic acid and actually they uh, result in the production of mediator of hemostasis. So the good example of this is um, the Celebrex, which is no steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that blocks the production of COX-2, or it's a COX-2 inhibitor, which uh, may reduce the inflammation secondary to arthritis, and uh, as that uh, occurs, the pain secondary to arthritis decreases. However, when um, people take Celebrex, the COX-1 and thromboxane levels, which is a mediator of hemostasis or a mediator, a chemical mediator of clotting, occurs or increases, I would say, as compensation. And because of that, they may develop the hypercoagulative disorders. And uh, by hypercoagulative disorders, I mean uh, increased risk for stroke, heart attack, or uh, thrombus of any other kind. So what happened that thromboxane A2 result, increase of it results in the developing of the clot. So that's why yeah, the prescription of Celebrex is somewhat limited or was very limited a few years ago, but now it's again picking up although there is there are strict regulations to inform patients about possible side effects and increased risk for stroke and heart attack however of course as anti-inflammatory drug it works uh, great but again if you prescribe it 
or if your patient already receives it, they need to know, your patients need to know that there is an increased risk for stroke and heart attack. And that's of course a consequence of increase of one of the clotting mediators, clotting factors, thromboxane A2 as a result of COX-1 metabolism, which comes from arachidonic acid uh, metabolism. Let's look at this scenario. You are taking care of a patient who had a stroke and physician prescribed tissue plasminogen activator. And uh, at this point, uh, one of the patient relatives is asking why they didn't give him heparin or warfarin instead. Of course, um, you know the answer and you will be uh, explaining this to patient and to patient's family, educating the, them about this. This situation, it's not hypothetical or uncommon. I can reassure you sooner or later in your nursing practice, this will happen. And there are lots of people that learn from sources like internet or um, other internet sources like Wikipedia or somewhere or have a relative who takes these drugs and they know that heparin and warfarin used for coagulative disorders but so they would start inquiring why why this is, are you trying to harm my uh, relative that you will see this question in any way shape and form. That's why it's important to study pathophysiology and know your answers, not because of this only, but it will be helpful for you in the situations like this when you actually trying to educate the patient and the family. So before we talk about this scenario, let's talk about plasminogen. What is plasminogen? Plasminogen is a plasma protein, which is a proenzyme. As we remember, most everything in the blood that circulates in relation to clotting or coagulation is inactive. When plasminogen is converted to active form, it's called plasmin. So plasminogen activators can be formed all over the body in endothelial lining of the vessels, liver and kidneys. And by all over the body, I meant only these three sources, not literally all over the body. So plasmin will be formed from plasminogen and plasmin is the active substance. So uh, plasmin will help to digest the fibrin and fibrin uh, also uh, will affect clotting factors such as fibrinogen, factor 5, factor 8 and most importantly prothrombin and factor 12. What's important about this entire process that the plasminogen will be inactivated by a plasmin inhibitor or plasmin will be inactivated I'm sorry which um, is helpful because the acting of plasmin is only localized to certain clot that we need to dissolve it's not floating around but before even plasminogen has a tendency before even plasminogen is converted to plasmin, we need to activate it. And that's where tissue plasminogen activators come into play. These are naturally synthesized substances and they can come from different sources. Again, liver, vascular, uh, endothelial lining, so 
the activators will be released in response to events such as an occlusion of the vein and exercise and uh, other uh, other uh, factors such as certain drugs, certain vasoactive drugs, but these factors are very unstable. However, they at the time they released and they find plasmin until I'm sorry, they find plasminogen and tell plasmin to convert to plasmin. I just said tell plasmin to convert to plasmin, tell plasminogen to convert to plasmin, which starts eating the fibrin and dissolving the clot. So this is how it works. Again, tissue plasminogen activator can be natural or can be synthesized and given as a medication for a stroke. And by stroke, we mean the occlusive stroke, thrombotic stroke. So the question, what doctor is trying to accomplish from here, we know doctor is trying to dissolve the clot. So what's the difference between heparin, warfarin, and tissue plasminogen activator? The difference is very simple. The difference is that heparin and warfarin are acting on prevention of blood blood clot formation while tissue plasminogen activator by activating plasminogen which is converted to plasmin which is it's the fibrin in the blood clot are digesting the clot or is digesting the clot so TPA helps clot digestion while heparin and warfarin are merely preventing it. Heparin molecules are basically cofactors that work on antithrombin. Antithrombin is a substance that can inactivate thrombin and other clothing factors such as factor 10 and uh, some other factors. So that's how heparin works and heparin can be synth synthesized by body itself while warfarin we already said that it affects the synthesis of the vitamin K which is coagulation factor is uh, that's synthesized by the liver so uh, when we talk about heparin you need to remember that this is drug that can be uh, digested and cross the GI tract and has to be given by injection, IV, or subcutaneously. And uh, that's how it works. But again, the answer to this scenario is heparin and warfarin are preventing clot formation while TPA will actively facilitate clot dissolution. Hypercoagulation disorders can be result of several factors. When increased of the number of the platelets, you have too many platelets in the blood, platelet aggregation, which means platelets are clumping too much together, endothelial damage, and as I talked about, this endothelial damage can result in uh, the decrease of production of several anti-clothing factors, such as heparin or uh, even tissue plasminogen activator, and uh, increased procoagulation factors for some reason and decreased anticoagulation factor and by decreased anticoagulation factors we can von Wilderbrand factor uh, is part of this type of 
decrease but also von Wildebrand is a consequence of endothelial damage. What can influence decreased platelets levels or thrombocytopenia? Penia is decreased number and cyto cells, so thrombocytopenia decreased number of the platelets. Decreased production, increased destruction, and you just have too many clots forming at the same time, so we just can't provide enough platelets, even our production is normal. Also, you can have normal platelet production number, but they are having impaired platelet function. They're not functioning normally. I'd like to talk to disseminated intravascular coagulation as a disorder who is rather paradoxical because it's involved it involves hypercoagulability and hypocoagulability so at the same time too much clotting will occur and at the same time too little clotting will occur so what happens some type of trigger will initiate the one of the pathways in coagulation and it may be either intrinsic or extrinsic doesn't matter so intrinsic um, pathway can be activated with extensive endothelial lining damage and uh, endothelial lining damage can occur through injury from infection, virus, some type of immune disorder, uh, blood stasis, extrinsic at the same time may occur when tissue factors uh, become activated. And extrinsic pathway is very common and uh, OB GYN disorders, obstetrics complications, basically, that's the extrinsic factor. So also complications of cancer may lead to this and also big trauma. But intrinsic pathway, it's really endothelial injury. Again, this goes with what I said before, intrinsic pathways and endothelial injury, extrinsic is extrinsic is um, tissue injury, of course. So both of them doesn't matter what's the pathway, they result in thrombin generation. And thrombin generation in this case is quite extensive. And um, you know, extensive production of thrombin results in clotting, thrombosis, and thrombosis can bring two things into play. When we have thrombosis with lots of vascular fibrin deposited, so we'll have ischemia in the tissues. Also, the blood cells itself will be destructed. Too much thrombin leads to plasminogen getting into the play. So plasminogen or TPAs will jump on plasminogen and activate it, which result in plasmin generation, which will result in blood clot destruction or fibrinolysis and the products of destruction of the blood clot or fibrin they will inhibit thrombin and platelet aggregation so basically we have so much clot destruction because we had too many too much clot to deal with to start with so we don't want any more forming because the fibrin 
products that's what they are thinking that's what they are doing and they prevent thrombin and platelet aggregation so this all will result in bleeding thrombin production also will result in platelets consumption for the clot of course so we don't have enough platelets to provide clots so all this again will result in bleeding so we have two results in here and it's paradoxical we have thrombosis clotting and we have too much bleeding at the same time so how to deal with this even this is a coagulation disorder even it pa seems paradoxical and we're all thinking let's just deal with coagulation although the coagulation mechanism per se not effective they work as they supposed to work so to treat this it's important to treat the underlying disorders so if um, disseminated intravascular coagulation occurs then a person may exhibit different signs and symptoms secondary to failure of the vital organs such as kidney heart lung even brain that clots may deposit or may extensive bleeding may occur at the same time uh, as i said hemolytic anemia can happen and patient may have signs of hypoxia so primary disease management is uh, very important in here also if patient present with excessive bleeding important to replenish those plasma proteins and um, somehow correct that deficiency at the same time we may consider giving anticoagulants such as heparin again this is very complex and critical condition and uh, to summarize it's hyper and hypocoagulation occur at the same time and the diagram describes it very well treatment involves a treatment of primary disorder and b replenishment of lost clotting factors and um, also uh, administration of anti-clotting uh, substances such as heparin so and again the main thing about this this is paradoxical bleeding and clotting occur pretty much at the same time let's talk about disorders of red blood cells and red blood cells as we know the other name for this are erythrocytes red blood cells contain hemoglobin that's vital for oxygen transport hemoglobin molecule in the adult has two alpha chains and two beta chains and by saying chains these are polymers or polypeptides so each chain has hemigroup each chain attached to the hemigroup um, basically protein and hemi unit hemi unit is an iron atom surrounded by um, hemi unit itself and iron atom is vital to connect to oxygen transported and release it so oxygen binds to basically hemi group or iron containing group but uh, again there are four chains each one has a hemi group so you can have uh, for transportation four molecules of oxygen in each molecule of hemoglobin let's talk about production of red blood cell and how it happens 
when the blood has consistent low oxygen level it signals to kidneys to start producing erythropoietin erythropoietin as a thrombopoietin simulates bone marrow to produce red blood cells of course erythropoietin is for red blood cells thrombopoietin is for platelets and when bone marrow is stimulated it will result in creation of new red blood cells which are initially reticulocytes and then are mature red blood cells so to answer these questions why a man who receiving chemotherapy for cancer may develop anemia because what can happen the chemotherapy can be destructive to bone marrow and it will result in anemia and why men with a renal failure would develop anemia because kidneys won't be able to respond correctly to erythropoietin need kidneys won't respond when decreased blood oxygen need is present so in this case kidneys just won't produce erythropoietin bone marrow is not stimulated and you don't have red blood cell production that's needed for the patient to sustain needs for oxygen so a patient will be anemic even though nothing wrong with his bl red uh, blood cell production from the bone marrow and bone marrow can produce enough but kidneys don't make enough erythropoietin so bone marrow isn't stimulated enough bone marrow is the site of red blood cell synthesis so it can be stored there and released immature red blood cells are nucleated they are they have their nucleus reticulocytes are still um, have endoplasmic reticulum although they lost already their they lost the nucleus and mature red blood cells have pretty much nothing but their hemoglobin red blood cells will last about four months or some say from three to four months because it's not like 120 day passed and red blood cell is checks out and the reason they last uh, they are not staying forever because their membranes become weak because of the fact that they have squeezed between the tissues through the uh, very thin narrow capillaries it's wear and tear there is no way to for red blood cell to repair itself because they don't have nuclear so it's just one time deal so no new components will be made and uh, the damage is again when red blood cells go through capillaries they break because of membrane weakness but again membrane is not repaired because of the absence of nuclear or absence of really anything else that can that can help to repair the cell so after they damaged they are out of circulation most red blood cells will break in the spleen and certain type of leukocytes in the spleen will process red blood cells and um, it will result in creation of unconjugated bilirubin so unconjugated bilirubin also can be produced in liver bone marrow or even lymph nodes and unconjugated bilirubin actually a toxic form 
of uh, bilirubin and it has to be processed into conjugated form that we all see in the bile. In the, this question, while men with defective red blood cells will develop hepatosplenum megaly because there will be too much to process in liver and spleen. So anyway, but the main, of course, site of processing is spleen and red blood cells turns into unconjugated bilirubin, which is uh, in turn processed by liver and iron is reused. Of course, we are not losing much iron through the processing of bilirubin. Unconjugated bilirubin will be toxic, like I said. So we want to turn it into something that can be used. So too much bilirubin unconjugated will result in jaundice. And jaundice is patient will turn yellow. Sometimes it's so extensive the yellow has somewhat green tinge. Liver can conjugate the bilirubin by linking it to gluconeride and uh, it used for production of bile. Again, the question is very complex here. Why would a man with liver failure develop jaundice? Because liver just doesn't process the bilirubin and it can and it stays in the blood and stays there and stays there, accumulates and deposited in, so in, in the tissues and you can see it in the skin or sclera of the eyes. So what happens when your red blood cells are destroyed outside the spleen? And when it happens in some capillaries outside the spleen, which can happen, some worn and torn red blood cells will give up in the, uh, uh, in the vessels. So hemoglobin will be floating freely in the blood. So when hemoglobin floating in the blood, it's not a good thing. It will re result in hemoglobinemia and the kidney will try to remove the broken or freely floating hemoglobin out of the body and it will result in hemoglobinuria. I tried to make the squares appropriate color and you will see the hemoglobinuria is a brownish color. So hemoglobin urea, it's not again bloody urine, it's a free hemoglobin floating in it removed by kidneys and it will have color of whatever it is the drink of your choice, of Pepsi, Coke, uh, Diet Coke, the most descriptive I heard was Guinness beer and it really has that dark tinge of the uh, stout beer saying like coke that coke probably exaggeration it's fairly dark like a stout beer so again i said here cola colored but it's more dark beer colored and in this question you can answer it why malaria called black water fever um, this is a trivia question look up yourself but remember what happened in malaria this is not a test question to alleviate your fears and I don't want you to spend too much time on it but remember what can happen in malaria and if you don't know you can look it up if you don't feel looking it up don't look it up but looking it up will help you remember the chain on the right side what happened but black water Remember where the what can be called water in human organism and black water and fever. So good luck looking this up. If you have problems, please contact me. And again, this is not 
on the test. Your la laboratory workup will reveal the values as following for men and women. Men have higher content of hemoglobin than women and again every facility may have slightly different scale for labs but uh, usually they will follow these numbers fairly closely. So men have 14 to 16 and a half grams per deciliter while women will have 12 to 15 uh, grams per deciliter. It's possible to call men anemic, let's say we'll say 13, while women will be considered within normal range. Hematocrit is the, is the amount of um, cellular material what that comes out from spinning the blood in the tube, basically in centrifuge, and uh, whatever is the sediment type of material. So men will have 40 to 50 percent of hemoglobin and women 37 to 47. Again, bilirubin can be measured as a um, byproduct of the hemoglobin breakdown and red blood cells breakdown and it's usually 0 to 1.2 grams per deciliter. But um, that's an important lab to show the liver func function or anything else can be going on with hemoglobin and uh, in the body. So again, these are the three important labs for blood. I would like for you to remember, and you can look at this yourself and say the ratio of normal hemoglobin to normal hematocrit is one, two, three. Let's say your patient had hemoglobin of 14 and 14 times three will be 42. So you can see that lower level in men is 40. So approximately one to three ratio. If that ratio is higher or lower, that may signify uh, changes in the blood such as dehydration or uh, excessive fluid volume. Again, if the hematocrit is higher than uh, three, one to three, that means you have too much, you have too much blood cells and too little water. If hematocrit is lower, that means that you have too much water and too little um, red blood cells. MCV is mean corpuscular volume. It's the size of the cells. MCHC, mean corpuscular hemoglobin con concentration, it's the concentration of hemoglobin and MCH is mean cell hemoglobin. MCHC and MCH, they both uh, reflect the color of the cell and MCHC is more commonly used, but um, the more concentrated hemoglobin is, the more red it will appear. The blood will be more red appearing and it's possible to measure and uh, RDW, it's red blood cells distribution weight. Some of you took statistic, but without going into statistics so, and talking about distribution weight. Distribution weight is the difference between sizes of the cells. If the distribution is wide, it means we have variety of the sizes of the cells from very little ones to relatively large ones. If it's narrow, means they are uniform and they are normal. So wide distribution or increased number here will reflect that you have variety of the cells. Variety of the cell usually means that you are bleeding and producing 
rather small or even immature cells trying to replenish blood loss quickly. So you want this to be relatively narrow or a small number, the cells being uniform. Anemias. Anemias. This is the language of anemias. Normocytic, macrocytic, and microcytic. This relates to the size. And by size, we mean mean corpuscular volume. So if it's normal size, but patient still anemic, means hemoglobin level is low, then it will be normocytic. Macrocytic, the size of cells is huge. Microcytic is the cells are small. So you can sell microcytic anemia, macrocytic anemia. Normochromic and hypochromic are related to the color or hemoglobin concentration in this case. So normochromic, normal color, hypochromic, hemoglobin isn't concentrated or hemoglobin, it's pale. So you can say normocytic, normochromic anemia or macrocytic, hypo, um, normochromic anemia or microcytic hypochromic anemia. You can use these words together all the time depending on the size of the cells and depending on the color of the cells. And there is no hyperchromic definition because um, without going into too much detail you just can't have too much color in red blood cells. So it's usually normal to hyperchromic. Um, different types of anemias pictured on this diagram. Iron deficiency anemia will be when the cells are small because we don't have enough iron to make big cells or normal cells. Megaloblastic anemia is when the cells are huge. Megaloblastic anemia and it's usually B12 or folic acid deficiency. and Big cells are dysfunctional, so you can have big cells, but you still won't have enough sufficient number of them to carry the oxygen carrying capacity, or they may have lower the oxygen carrying capacity whatsoever. But sickle cell disease, cells are sickled in the crisis, and they can stuck in places that they are not supposed to to cause sickle cell crisis and pain and also ischemia. In normal cells, you can see it's like you just went to Dunkin' Donuts and brought a box of donuts and they are laying around waiting to be eaten. And there is an indentation in the middle, which is roughly comparable to the side of the cell. That's how it would look. So the hole in the donut the diameter of the hole in the donut is equal to the diameter of the side of the donut. Picture it like that, so that normocytic anemia. And you see sufficient size. They are not too many, but they kind of overlap. And that's the normocytic normal size of cells. Okay, This just describes the size of cell. You really cannot tell how many or is it anemic or not, but most of the time megaloblastic or iron deficiency. Small cells, you see that they are too tiny even to have the indentation in the middle, although, of course, there is no nucleus. Causes of anemia, blood loss, wound stabbing by the knife and losing blood, versus blood loss, let's say from cancerous small tumor in the gut that bleeds continuously, hemolysis, breakdown of the cells extensively, and impaired production, impaired synthesis. So the last one, of course, is when the bone marrow is impaired, can make enough cells. When we have iron deficiency anemia, and it's often caused by blood loss. Again, it's slow bleeding tumor, wound injury. It can be even surgical wound. Patient lost some blood during the surgery, so 
uh, but this is very clear cut cause. In iron deficiency anemia, patient will have microcytic hypochromic anemia with increased RDW because they're losing blood, but they still have normal side cells and there are lots of new cells in circulation which are relatively small and uh, RDW will increase because of that. And it will be hypochromic because the new cells are pale. Megaloblastic anemias are B12 anemia, which is another word is pernicious anemia, and folic acid deficiency. B12 anemia is notorious or alcoholics are notorious to develop B12 anemia because impair absorption of B12. Also people with impaired GI um, production of intrinsic factor may have B12 deficiency. This can be resolved by for people with alcoholism in acute state, I intravenous injections of B12, but for someone who just missing intrinsic factor necessary to absorb B12 from GI tract by intramuscular monthly B12 injections. And folic acid is easy to correct by oral administration of folic acid. So both of those deficiencies will dis result in increased cell size and uh, B12 deficiency interferes with DNA production and increased size of the cells which are not effective. So that's why patient anemic. A plastic anemia, again bone marrow depression, basically we can't produce too much because we don't have facilities. And chronic disease anemias chronic inflammation and chronic renal failure. Let's talk about the second a little more. Chronic renal failure is uh, resulting in decreased erythropoietin production and decreased stimulation of the bone. So in this case, we will have normocytic, normochromic anemia because our bone has normal producing capacities of the of the anemia, um, I'm sorry, our bone has normal producing capacities to produce red blood cells. Our bone has normal capacities to produce red blood cells. However, we don't have enough signaling to encourage that production. Iron deficiency anemia, again, hypochromic and microcytic and uh, the cells will look pale and small. And polkiocytosis also may result, irregular shape. Anisocytosis, it's irregular size. Again, this is the, just the consequence of uh, having, of having uh, not enough iron or hemoglobin to produce the cells. The cell in the middle is some type of white cell with uh, granules, so that's not uh, iron deficiency. Iron deficiency anemia, you can see anisocytotic cells and polkiocytotic cells uh, present. Small cells, they are rather oval or they don't have that donut indentation in the middle. Megaloblastic, huge cells. Again, um, folic acid deficiency or B12, I talked about it, pernicious anemia, again, B12 deficiency, uh, secondary to absence of intrinsic factor, which is necessary for GI absorption. And uh, again, the cells will present the same way. Is it folic acid or B12? You really cannot tell by looking at the cell. But the red cells will be huge, oval shape, poikilocytosis and uh, anisocytosis and uh, this will be like somewhat like oval or teardrop shape cells.
hemolytic anemias are membrane disorder. This one of them is hereditary spherocytosis, and uh, acquired hemolytic anemias can be something like a drug may cause hemolysis and hemolytic disease of the newborn. So hemolytic disease of the newborn, again, was, um, may result in uh, excessive deposits of bilirubin under the skin because excessive um, presence of destruction, because of the excessive drug destruction of uh, fetal hemoglobin and uh, the newborn will turn yellow. It's one of the first nursing interventions uh, performed regarding this disorder in um, 19th century in England and what happened one of the nurses was very diligent about uh, the fact that fresh air and sunlight will be only a benefit to everyone so, and she would take all the babies especially the ones who turned yellow outside and lay them under the sun and uh, eventually the babies who were under the supervision of this lady uh, were losing the yellow tinge and were developing better than others in other hospitals or wards so one of the um, physicians actually uh, wrote a paper and presented that uh, phenomenon however the use of phototherapy wasn't widespread until 20th century and nowadays you will see the ultraviolet r lights in the nursery where the baby can be placed and have their own personal tanning bed and get uh, a read of excessive bilirubin. Excessive bilirubin of course destroyed by ultraviolet light so ultraviolet light will help to combat this. Again to deal with consequences of hemolytic disease of the newborn it's the best way so far to do is using phototherapy, sunlight, or ultraviolet light. Of course, in moderation, you don't want sunburns on baby or anyone else. So please do it under supervision and do it if only if prescribed. Hemoglobinopathies and thalassemia and sickle cell anemia sickle cell anemia may result as a change in the shape sickle cell disease so it's a mutation in beta chain of hemoglobin so if hemoglobin is severely deoxygenated beta and I shouldn't use more severely it's just deoxygenated beta chain link they just clamp together they will become a long protein rod that m will kind of stick through the cell and make it si sickle basically imagine you stuck a rod through the um, balloon and it's stretching it turning into like um, football so when this happened these cells cannot travel and they're getting stuck. They cause strokes, retinal infarcts, stuck in the eyes, in lungs, and uh, they can even block the blood flow to bones. A vascular necrosis, ephemeral head can happen. And um, also they cause painful infarcts in extremities and fingers and toes the, the, oh, secondary to ischemia of course pain occurs and in skin because of not enough oxygen supply the skin ulcers will occur the spleen will have 
eventual atrophy and also chronic kidney disease will develop. Blocking the capillaries by sickled cells will result in acute pain. Infarctions again will cause uh, damage to most of the vital organs and it's somewhat related to diabetes damage but of course the mechanism is completely different but this is also end organ damage and diabetes of course doesn't affect uh, everything to this extent so sickle cells are being destroyed extensively so patients may develop jaundice as a result. Um, people who have only alpha chain or people with some fetal hemoglobin which um, has only alpha chains and gamma chains are protected from sickle cell disease because neither alpha or gamma can sickle. Only beta chains can do this and only beta chains can sickle. So some people will have certain amount of alpha and gamma chains uh, hemoglobin. Gamma chains is a chain specific for fetal hemoglobin and that's why they won't have sickle cell disease to that extent even if they have a trait for it. Thalassemias are defective chains uh, of hemoglobin and uh, this results because of there is a defective gene for alpha chain synthesis or defective gene for beta chain synthesis. Um, and depends how many genes are involved, the uh, severity of disease may happen. And when you compare alpha and beta, just uh, briefly, you will notice one uh, interesting phenomenon. Of course, fetal hemoglobin doesn't have beta. And uh, that's the reason that alpha thalassemia will affect both fetal and adult hemoglobin. And uh, in uh, beta, hem it's only affect adult. Um, so people with Asian descent may develop alpha and beta thalassemias are more uh, prominent in people with Mediterranean origins such as uh, Greek and Italian. The variety of disease presentation or clinical manifestation may be uh, quite uh, wide in this disorder. So patient may be severely anemic and uh, present with the need for transfusion while in other cases there will be essentially no clinical manifestations for these uh, people. So alpha thalassemia may uh, result in uh, newborn and in newborn, this uh, can be quite severe manifestation. So when all the alpha chains are deleted and the patient only has, or a baby only has a gamma chains, or this is fetal hemoglobin, the HB BART created so gamma-4 hemoglobin created. And uh, gamma-4 unfortunately has strong affinity to oxygen. What will happen, it will capture the oxygen molecule, but it will never release it to the tissues they need it. Um, and uh, if this happens, unfortunately, this may result in death in utero or shortly after the birth because this is again inability to transport oxygen and uh, in beta form sometime um, sometime
time patient would need transfusion some time patient may need even um, phlebotomy therapy because uh, they need to get rid of uh, defective hemoglobin and you know. so bone marrow transplant may result in the cure of some patients but uh, again a variety of the clinical symptoms in both disorders may vary depending on the number of the genes occurred and uh, some consider that these are not real anemias but also this can result as a real anemia with hemolysis but again treatment may vary and from uh, the manifestation also can vary from uh, death in utero or shortly after birth in severe alpha disorders versus uh, quite in um, uneventful uh, clinically course for people with beta hemoglobin deficiency so and this concludes the lecture for blood disorders and please contact me if you have any questions